Influencers, inspiration, and Instagram, Instagram, Instagram. This is Earned by Tribe Dynamics. Here's Connor Begley. Hi, everyone. Connor here. Uh, Welcome back to another episode of Earned, the podcast where Tribe tries to bring you the best from founders and operators in the beauty, fashion, and lifestyle industries. Today, we have, we're very lucky today. Uh, So we have Amanda Baldwin here, who is the president at Supergoop. Um, so welcome, Amanda. Thanks so much for joining. Yeah, great to be here. Fun to see you. Yeah, it's great to see you again, too, especially in this format. Um, it's, always, it's always different when you interview somebody versus like just have a conversation. It's like you can go so much more in depth, which is kind of fun. Looking forward to it. Um, so the reason Amanda, we are very lucky to have Amanda today, is if you were to look at her kind of accomplishments, I think she just has a lot of things that we can learn from. Um, So her background, she did her undergrad at Harvard before getting her MBA at Wharton. Um, After that, she went on to be an investment banker, or prior to that, I should say, prior to business school, she went on to be an investment banker at Goldman Sachs before going to private equity, where she says she fell in love with beauty while she was there. Um, And then after that, worked at some of the biggest brands, uh, so Estee, or longest standing, I should say, Estee Lauder, Clinique, uh, Dior, before going back into private equity at El Catterton, and then finally joining the startup world at Supergoop where I think she has had her best accomplishments to date. Um, so since she started, uh, she has 10 x or helped to 10 x the size of the business uh, and profitability from a revenue perspective and from an EMV perspective. Over the last three years, she's grown 370%, um, going from the number 50 skincare brand to the number 24 as of 2020. Um, so really, really exciting. Um, uh, excited to have you here and excited to get into the questions. Thank you. Those are some new stats for me <laughs> on the EMV side. That's, that's exciting to hear. We, we saw we just broke into the top 10 in July. So there's been a lot of woohooings over Slack in the last 24 hours. So that was exciting for us to see as well. Well deserved too. Um, okay. Well, let's go ahead and start with your background. So, you know, when I read your background, to me, it reads like the resume for, or the guide to becoming a fortune 500 CEO. Is that, is that your goal or what, what, what are your goals? And also, you know, I, for, for me, one of the mistakes I think I made in my career was I didn't really think too far ahead, um, which I know for you is, you know, you don't want to think too far ahead, but is this kind of what you had planned out from the beginning or, or did you have a different plan when you were younger? Uh, my plan has changed many times and I actually think you, you are the right one uh, that you cannot foresee the future or plan too far in advance. Uh, And so I actually think you have things figured out that took me a little longer to figure out. Uh, You know, when I went to Wall Street, uh, I thought, you know, maybe maybe this will be it. Um, I loved it. I learned so much. I learned things that I still draw on today. Uh, And then I had a a moment, a sort of like, am I on the wrong side of the table moment um, when I was an investor and I looked at people who are running the businesses. And I, I literally remember saying to myself, but I think they're having all the fun. And we can talk a little bit about what my definition of that was, because the other thing I've learned is all the answers of what a, makes a great career are so personal and so unique to an individual. Uh, and, you know, I will, I will tell you, and I will embarrassingly admit that if you look at the, the Wharton, I think it was like a graduating list of most likely to become I was the Fortune 500 CEO, <laughs> and you know, I will tell you, it's 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 a lot to live up to. Um, yeah. Obviously, Supergoop is not a Fortune 500 company, uh, and I actually, you know, and I think it's worth sharing with people the the moment that I decided to go indie and go smaller. And I know we're going to talk a little bit about that, but I remember thinking about that plan that I had, and I did write my business school essay about wanting to run a beauty brand one day. Uh, But I felt this sort of obligation to the outside world that I had decided I was going to be in a large organization. And I still think about, was that the right choice? Did I, did I leave something that I should have done? And, and, you know, I, I have sort of learned to be much more confident in the moment and more confident in the individual decisions, but giving up that, idea. Maybe I haven't given it up. We'll see. (laughs) Uh, I think probably I have because I think I sort of took a different path, but it was, it became such a big definer of who I was seen by the outside world that I had to kind of get comfortable with 
following what I saw in the moment, what I saw on in the industry trends and what I wanted right then for my career and let go of this kind of crazy label that had been put on me. So a lot of lessons learned on that. And I have to give yourself more credit for thinking a little bit more short term, short term, I think it'd be super liberating. Uh, I think, I don't think you realize how short term I think. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 right. We may have different definitions of short term. Yeah, I have some general long term visions, but um, it's, you know, it's, it's day to day, week to week. Um, so would you say you've had more fun at kind of a smaller brand or what, what have been the differences for you? I mean, you've, you've operated within the kind of big brand space and the small brand space. Do you, would you say you have a preference at this point? No, I've, I've had fun and I have learned and I have every step of the way. Um, I'm a big believer. I've never looked back, no regrets. Everything is always part of some journey that you're right. Maybe you don't know at the beginning what the end point is. Uh, but I just like, I believe that every step has a purpose. So I don't regret for a second um, anything that I've done in, in my career. And I literally could sit here and we won't do this, but go through every, every role that I've had in every organization and tell you how it applies to what I do today and why, because I had that experience, I'm better at what I do now. And yeah, that goes from Wall Street and I run Excel models through my head when we're making <laughs> decisions and the big brands taught me, you know, I always sort of say it, it's, it's a lot easier. My, my brother's an architect. So I think, you know, it's like, a, it's a lot easier to build a house if you know what a house looks like. So because I was in these huge multi-billion dollar global brands, I have a sense of what I'm trying to create, um, what we're trying to create at Supergoop. Um, and those are sort of wildly profound experiences. Being an investor really impacts how I think, uh, you know, I've been in brands that were, you know, much more challenged and that really has influenced uh, how I think. So I really, you know, I, I wouldn't trade any of it and I, and I would be remiss if I also didn't speak about the individuals who impacted me along the way. Uh, I have just had the opportunity to be around and just absorb just some incredible people. Uh, and especially early on in my career, it's like my number one piece of advice is, is who you work with and who, who that leader is in your organization makes such a profound impact on who you are and what you, what you learn at a, at a sort of young point in your career. And I just, one after another, um, and everyone unique. I learned different things from different people. And, and I think that that combination and, and not having just one perspective has also been really important to me. Yeah, I think prioritizing learning early in your career is just critical, right? Like, how do you put yourself in an environment where you're going to learn as quickly as possible? And I think surrounding yourself with people that are, you know, smarter, more accomplished, more just that have things that you can learn from is just a really good way to do that. Right. Um, yeah. And I don't think people necessarily, I think people too often going back to short term versus long term, too often will prioritize, well, okay, this job pays me, you know, 10% more. So I'm going to take this job versus that job. It's like, no, 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 no. Don't prioritize a company that's growing that has really smart people that you can learn from that has something that you believe in generally. And the, you know, the compensation will follow for sure. Yeah. My, my, I went to an all girls school, um, K through 12 Spence, I'll give it a shout out. And our motto was not for school, but for life we learn. Uh, yeah. And that is, that still carries with me to this day. I, you know, you mentioned early in your career, I'd say still now. I mean, mm -hmm. you know that I call you up randomly and like, Connor, talk to me. <laughs> like, what, what should I know? Educate me. I mean, I, I obviously really enjoy our conversations, but I, I do them with everybody i i like i feel like there's always something else i'm always reading i'm always kind of trying to think about is there a different way to do this is there a better way to do this just i think i think it's what keeps it fun too and i it's the reason when you when you asked about you know you said sort of falling in love with beauty part of falling in love with beauty for me was that it just didn't seem that it would ever stay still um that it had this kind of long long history um it felt like a great business but it also felt like something that would just was driven by change, was driven by evolution and, it, and innovation. And that for me was really exciting because it meant, and I honestly, I don't think I even understood what I was signing up for and yeah. how much change it would go through from my first days as an intern at Clinique to now and 
I think we're about to go through a whole new revolution and evolution of this, of this business. And I'm really excited about it. Um, I love that. I think if it stayed the same, it would get boring. I, I think a lot about that in the kind of with regards to the software industry, which we're in, right? Like when you think about kind of, if you were to distill down the last 20 years in a history book, there would certainly be a section dedicated to the software industry and how that transformed a lot of businesses and just the world in general, as well as that would be written very specifically about like Silicon Valley, San Francisco, et cetera. And so being in the center of change is just incredibly exciting. Obviously it's scary at times, um, but I think you're right. Like brands are going through significant upheaval um, due to the internet, due to just a variety of issues. Um, so it's got to be fun to be right in the middle of all that. Yeah, I mean, it was what, you know, it's what drew me to going to a smaller brand uh, was that I thought, and it has now proven to be the case that I could be a part of the next generation. I could either kind of watch it happen uh, or I could go be a part of building something that was part of the next generation. And that was super motivating to me to kind of, yeah, to sit in the center of it uh, and get to be one of the, you know, we, we really think of ourselves as change makers. I think there's, there's no bigger change than you can have than literally creating a category, literally changing consumer behavior, which is a whole nother level of what we undertake every day at Supergoop. So the brand's not just unique and the digital tools aren't just unique. And, you know, you can, all these things that I think are, are common against, uh, you know, across a lot of indie brands that, that I know you follow closely, but we're actually getting people to do something they weren't doing before. Um, and that is sort of wild and exciting. Let's talk about that a little bit. So, you know, I've observed it. So both, you know, having watched Supergoop, as well as having watched some of your interviews and read some of what you talk about. And what I really liked was that you guys are marketing a category, not necessarily a product. So for you guys, the category being skin cancer, sun damage, SPF, more than you're marketing Supergoop. I know that's not necessarily the exact path that I imagine Clinique or Estee Lauder or Dior have done historically. Was that a big shift for you? Was that something that was kind of pre-installed when you showed up and that you just adapted to? Or was it something that you kind of, you internally pushed as, a, as an agenda? I mean, this, this is at the very core of the origin story of our brand. And I, I wouldn't even go so far as to say we're marketing a category. I would say we're following a mission. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, our founder, Holly, created this brand, almost created a nonprofit organization because she had a friend who was diagnosed with skin cancer. And she started to understand why that happened to someone at age 29, that it was you know, about daily SPF usage. And this was back in 2005. So just, you know, I remember what I was doing. I was um, a manager at Clinique and I remember what the ecosystem of beauty looked like. And to, to have Holly's vision of saying, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to get everybody to wear sunscreen every single day. That took a lot of guts and it's taken a lot of guts and a lot of grit to get the brand to where it was in 2016 when I came on board. And we never, you know, marketing is, is certainly, you know, it's an easy definition of what it, of an industry term about some of the toolkits that we might use about the concept of, you know, what the job description might think about, but that's not, that's not how we think about it. It's really like, we have a mission, we have a goal, uh, and it's a much bigger purpose than that. Uh, and it, that was something that really, really drew me to the brand. I think the uniqueness of that. Uh, and I think now more than ever, the power of that, whether that means in sort of who we're able to attract to the team, we have sort of an amazing team and every single one of us is united by really believing in this. So you know, I, I would I would beg to differ that we're not marketing a category. We're we're following a mission, and and SPF was always something. You know, when I when I came here, a lot of people thought I was, gosh, Amanda, I'm not sure. Sunscreen, it's always been a mass category. It's super seasonal. You know, all these things. But there was there was some. I personally believed in it. I understood why it mattered, uh, and you know, I really saw the opportunity to like do something totally different. And, and while we're at it, make, make the world a better place. You know, one in five people is diagnosed with skin cancer. And obviously we're living in, you know, we're talking during a global pandemic. So there are lots of things that drive our health and wellness needs, but you know, that's something that's part of what we do every single day. Yeah. I mean, my dad has had a bunch of issues when it comes to kind of skin cancer. Um, nothing, 
uh, life threatening, thank God, but just a lot of problems caused by it. And so, and I think getting to that idea of kind of being mission driven, I think a lot of people talk about that, but very few people live it. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, one of the stats that really blew me away was they did this giant survey of all the engineering students um, across the country, asking them what are their, you know, what is the number one place that they want to work basically. And number three and four were like NASA. And I can't remember the fourth one, like the somewhere, somewhere that really, you would really respect. Right. But number one and number two were Tesla and SpaceX. And I think with both of those, those are such mission driven organizations that like it really makes people want to work, not just because of the compensation and the career growth and all these other elements, but to actually have an impact. Um, so it's pretty cool that you get to be a part of that. Uh, it's not, not actually super common. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I feel very fortunate. And I think we're all, you know, all of us on the team feel lucky to be able to do what we're doing every day. And I do, it, it makes you feel different. I think one of, the, one of the things that I learned early on in my career, and this is, you know, back to the stories of like, you never know where something's gonna lead you is when I was at Goldman, I started working for the vice chairman of the firm at the time. It was right after 9-11. Uh, and, you know, as a native New Yorker, I was like, I've got to go do something to be a part of helping the city recover. Mm -hmm. And watching how his power as a businessman allowed us to open doors and totally change, um, totally change like what was going on in New York City. And, you know, I won't go into all the details, but the point was, I remember at age, I think I was 21, 22, saying, wow, there is a path where business can, can create change. Um, and it was something that really was important to me then. And now has become, I think, so critical to our future as a, as a world, as a country, is, is to sort of think about what are our obligations as businesses to create change. Uh, and that belief that you can have a, you know, I'd actually thought about a career in nonprofit too at one point. And so the fact that I could do it both at once, uh, I was just kind of really eye opening to me. And I think is, I think the next generation has figured that out kind of naturally. I think there's just much more demand for that, but you know, it was really at that moment that I, you know, I just remember thinking, um, wow, this is possible. And the, his ability to create change was so amplified by his business career. Yeah, that had to have been a, a really interesting time, right? To be a native New Yorker in that time with an ability to have an impact. Um, you know, I was young and, you know, just <laughs> no way that I could have done anything at that point. But uh, yeah, the amount of uh, community that must have been shared there, just that general feeling must have been really special, despite the fact that it was obviously a horrific event. It was one of the hardest... Um, you know, yeah, really like traumatic experiences of, of my life, but also one of the most uplifting um, and one of the ones that I'm most proud of. So we're already pretty deep. Let's go even deeper. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's the point of this podcast. <laughs> Eventually we're going to get more into marketing and influencers. I promise. Uh, but I do, you know, when I was listening to your interviews, one of the things that I heard mentioned several times was this idea of kind of living up to your potential and that being one of your biggest fears that you wouldn't live up to your potential. Mm -hmm. I can tell you from the outside, you're doing pretty good so far. So mm -hmm. you're about halfway through the game. You're, you're, you're checking off most of the boxes I would imagine. Um, but for you, what does that mean? Like what does, you know, what are some of the things that you hope to accomplish? Um, mm -hmm. You know, if you were to look back in 30 years or 40 years, like what are the things you hope to have kind of to, to have done? Yeah, you know, again, these are things that sort of get planted in you really at an early age. Uh, and, you know, for me, living up to my potential was always is and always was, you know, I've been fortunate to have, you know, loving parents and incredible education, every door open to me. And so I better do something with that. Um, yeah. You know, I better make sure that I've contributed to, you know, the greater good, uh, you know, and we've obviously talked a lot about that already. So you can kind of see how it runs consistently through what I think about. Um, and also, you know, I, I think a lot about the greater good, but I also, I think a lot about, we talked also about, you know, these sort of uh, men and women along the way who have made a big difference for me. Uh, and I think a lot about, you know, gosh, I hope at some point someday 
somebody that's been on my team thinks about me that way. Um, and so I think about it in a, like a big picture way, but I also think about it on like a very individual way of, you know, hoping that I'm creating a path for somebody else. Uh, and, you know, there's nothing that makes me more proud than sort of seeing people blossom on our team and really get to kind of live up to live up to their potential. So I guess I sort of see my living up to my potential is helping other people live up to theirs. Um, and I love, I'm a, I'm a builder. I think this was something that it, it, even when I was in big companies, I always had a job that nobody had had before. I was always creating something new. I was always trying to figure out like what didn't exist before. Uh, and I think that has a lot to do with it um, that I feel like, gosh, I could actually be a part of creating something. Uh, and just the satisfaction of that I think is really wonderful. Do you think you'll ever start your own brand? I don't know. I think I've, I've never, I, you know, now that I spend so much time with Holly, I understand what kind of undertaking that is. I understand the kind of like blinders that you have to have about like, this will happen. Um, I remember meeting you, Connor, when you were just starting your business and you were in my office, like, I hope I'd be up to it. Um, I think I've <laughs> always believed that I'll know it if I have an idea that I feel like that kind of drive behind. Um, I haven't been struck by it yet. Um, I feel incredible excitement about what I'm doing, but I also, you know, I, I understand the difference between who I am and, and who a founder is. Um, so we'll, we'll see. I mean, I think you can do it, but obviously, you know, I'm a little biased. Um, I think it's funny you, so, a lot of the traits that you talk about in terms of like determination, perseverance, right? Hard work are, I think what are the elements of, you know, that you need to start a company. Like one of the stories that always stuck with me was we were about two years into tribe and one of our earliest investors, a guy named Travis said, he's like, he's like, guys, you made it to year two. I'm like, what does that mean? He's like, well, usually the trajectory, cause he makes a lot of these small investments He's like, people go through the first six months, which is like the honeymoon phase. It's exciting. Then the next six months are really hard. And they usually within a, within two years, they're, they're out, right? Because they don't, they don't, they can't work through those problems. Mm -hmm. And I think at a year we were making a thousand dollars a month, like no money at all, like, and working insane hours to, to make that thousand dollars a month. Um, but I, I always remember John and I sitting there and saying like, I'm going to drag this thing kicking and screaming into existence, whether it wants to exist or not. Mm -hmm. And so I think you're right that you need to have, there needs to be something there that's driving you because it certainly isn't financial gain. The likelihood of you making a lot of money is actually pretty low. Um, so yeah, but I still think you can do it. It's, you should do it. It's really I hard. It <laughs> um, okay. Let's talk about super group a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you said when you joined, there was absolutely no marketing happening right outside of press and just yeah. trying to create really great products. And um, so what were some of the first things that you implemented from a marketing perspective? And maybe it's that you hired people, right. That implemented things from a marketing perspective, but what were some of the first investments you, that you made there? And were there any that worked really well or things that you tried and you thought would work like, Hey, we did this at, you know, at Dior, it's definitely going to work here and it didn't work. Um, would love to hear a little bit about those early marketing days, um, you know, at a new brand. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I believe first, and if you're trying to accomplish something, you got to find somebody who's better at it than you are, um, mm -hmm. if you're in my shoes. So, you know, I think the marketing story of Supergroup really began um, when, when we hired Brittany, who's our VP of marketing, who is just mm -hmm. one of the most talented marketers I have ever had the good fortune of working with. Um, and she just has a knack for creativity and storytelling that I think is, you know, a second to none. So I, I would say that took me a year. <laughs> it took mine. <laughs> um, so, you know, the first year was a lot of, yeah, here's some things I know tactically. Um, you know, I, I knew about different kinds of paid media and I knew about, you know, Sephora and how to be successful at Sephora. And there were things that I was trying to do but I think it's like, it's not just what you're doing, it's how you're doing it. Uh, and I think the how is so important. It's what the content is, what the, what the imagery is, what, and what the product is. I mean, we, we, the big unlock for us and the big moment when we really said, aha, um, was when we launched on Scene Sunscreen. 
um, with the marketing plan that Brittany had devised. And we, you know, it was the combination of all those things happening uh, that I think really made sense. Um, and I think I, I, I do believe that. I think that there's, I've yet to figure out that there's some secret sauce, right? That there's like probably the things that I would ever say are the tools that we're using nobody's going to be so impressed <laughs> that, that, that we have something figured out that nobody else does, but it's yeah. how we do them and on the backs of what kind of product and with the rich DNA and brand storytelling of this, of what, you know, was sort of here. And the reason that I got excited about uh, this role was because I, when I was talking with Holly and understanding what she had created and looking at the aesthetics of the brand, I saw all the things that I had been trained to look for in LVMH. Uh, and you know, I was like, okay, you just have to start to figure out how to put a finer point on this and put some, put some money behind it. And, and the story of there that, you know, I do, I do think that you can't manufacture that. Um, that, and I think that there, you can build a brand with a nice pop by spending money and kind of doing things tactically that, that can work. But if you have the ambitions that we do of, you know, let, let's be, uh, you know, global, let's be the next multi-billion dollar brand. Let's, let's define a category. It's got to be built on the back of something with a lot more depth. Um, and I think we're still, you know, we're still learning. We're still uncovering. It's like, it's still a baby that we're nurturing and really figuring out, you know, all of those different elements. But I think that, um, you know, I think that it, the, the first phase of that journey was, was really hiring someone and letting her build her team and being a good, coach and sounding board from a strategic point of view and, and, and really having a product that just clicked. Were there any other really big unlocks that you had? Like you said, obviously that first kind of launch with Brittany involved. Um, I know we've talked about other markets, right? So international, China, et cetera. Were there any other big, big unlocks over the last few years that you think were, you know, uh, that you can look back on? I mean, it, it's, again, it's, it's now, it's no one thing. It's yep. everything, right. And it's, it's a team that, you know, certainly marketing is really important, but you've got to have a great sales organization, a great ops organization, you know, all, all of those things, finance, product development, like no one thing can carry the day. Uh, yeah. And I, and I think that like, so I, I think it's that, I think, it, and I, I also am a big believer in the power of you know omni-channel or whatever we're calling it now uh you know that that we have this deep and very important relationship with sephora um and and understanding how to position our brand in, in their environment was really important uh and we have a great website and and the pie is growing and then they have international and all these things so i try and think about how they all fit together and not just on any one individual element yeah, it's one of the frustrating things when you're trying to learn. You're like, hey, what's the one thing you did? It's like, it's not one thing. It's like 100, 100 improvements 100, of 1%. It's 100, it's 100 decisions. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's every decision. It's every person. It's, you know, when we have a win as a team, it's not one person's win. It's, it's the win, uh, you know, when we have a great market meeting or we have an amazing day on our website or we launch China and things go gangbusters, it's, it's no, it's no one person's win. It's every single person's win. And, and that's like how we built, that's how we think as an organization. But I think it's also true. Uh, and I think that's something that is like very embedded, I think probably in, in my mindset about how we, how we work. Um, but I think I've also seen it from, from other places that I've been. Again, this gets from the, the benefit of those early years of the organizations that you're in and kind of the imprint that that leaves on you. Did you, have you like set out or were there pre-existing kind of values outside of, you know, the basic mission statement, right? Because I know that for me, you know, those thousand decisions that we're talking about here, you want to make sure that they're aligned on a consistent basis. Um, have you gone through that process? I know Savannah at Tula talked about that a little bit. Um, or is it something that just kind of the mission drives the decisions? So no, actually it's been super deliberate. Um, yep, so yep. I, I think I'm going to try and figure out what timeline we would have been on. I think it would have been 2018, 18, at the end of 2018, we had kind of 
hired a lot of our leadership team, had some great people joining us. And I remember picking up my head and saying, I've been really thoughtful about our strategy. I've got a financial model that's a million pages long. I've got a product development calendar that, you know, we, we have more stuff than we know what to do. Like, we need to be as thoughtful about culture, and we can mm -hmm. talk about what the definition of that is, and who we operate and how we operate internally as we are with everything else. And so, you know, like any good startup president would, I started Googling, you know, how, how do you create culture? <laughs> And I started reaching out to people back to this, always be a learner. And it's like really fun in my, my role. And I reached out to some people that I had known who held, you know, very senior roles in HR and other, you know, I talked to a lot of brand founders. Like, how are you doing this? How are you thinking about this? I mean, I remember, I, like whenever I have a new thing that I'm trying to figure out, I just start talking to a lot of people and just trying to listen. Yeah, I've gotten those emails. Across. Hey Somebody Connor, came. I need to talk. Yeah, I, but I, I, you know, I'm, I and I, you know, I think I've I've learned that from other people of just like you've got to just listen and pattern, you know, try and see the patterns and everything. And I, and I, I like figured out how to, you know, we we couldn't afford to have a fancy firm come in here and do an offsite and all those things. So I figured out how to do it ourselves, mm -hmm. uh, and we did have an offsite and put together something and wonderful copywriter made it sound fabulous. And it's something that, you know, we go back to all the time. Um, it's on, it's on the walls of the office. We've reread it multiple times through this when people are not in the office, like we've gone back, we've actually gone back and edited it um, in the last six months and said like, what if this is still true? And what of this needs to be tweaked? And how do we make sure it still stays relevant? So I, we certainly have not left, left that up to chance. Um, <laughs> And I, I don't think you can. I think it, and I think it's easy to think that you can. I think I might have thought that I could, right? And I, and the more that I've learned of this is, just because it's in my own head, doesn't mean that it's in somebody else's. So, getting very explicit about things is super helpful for people, especially as an organization grows. It was it was definitely in a moment where I knew we were going to go hire a lot of people. Like, what were those cues that we were going to look for as we brought on new team members so that we would kind of bottle up all the magic um, and, and never lose it. So what is it then? So what are the values? Like, I'm not, I'll certainly share some of them with you. I mean, I think yeah. back, back, back to um, every, you, you'll see the consistency here. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, totally. Nothing if not predictable, but <laughs> you know, we, we say we are teachers and we are students. That's our first mm -hmm. one. And you know, that goes back to Holly was a teacher before she created this brand. Um, we are teaching the world to use SPF, right? That's very much who we are. Or also students. We don't expect ourselves to always have the right answer. Uh, and I think that sort of philosophy around we can always change, we can always do better, uh, we, can, we can teach each other new things that we really want to empower people to be experts in their domain, like all those things kind of roll into that. There's a whole paragraph that comes after. But you know, that is a really important one. Um, you know, another one that we talk a lot about is sort of the importance of just being nice. <laughs> uh, and nice is never overrated. Very uh, underrated, in fact. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's the one. Is that it's, ne it's never overrated. You can, you can never regret doing the right thing. Uh, and, you know, that's actually pretty powerful. Uh, and I think it really creates, you know, like, I, I look at, you know, through all of the last six months, I know there's a lot of talk out there about productivity. I'm like, that's actually not my measure. My, our team is crushing it. Um, <laughs> they are super productive. But like, I look for happiness. I look for joy. I look for learning. Those are the things that like get us every, every morning. So, you know, the, a lot of those are woven through. It's, it's a whole long document, but we had a lot of fun doing it. That's cool. I think... It's funny, I've, I've taken that all the way to the point. I really wanna write like a family set of values. Cause mm. I know that like my, my father-in-law kind of, not, not that it's written out, but it's definitely That's like really it's good. known, right? Um, I'm trying to remember, it's like family, humor, faith, and hard work are the four. And it's just like, I don't know, having a set of things, you're like, this is what's important to us yeah. um, is meaningful, particularly when it's not um, just fluff, right? Not corporate fluff, but it's mean it, it actually drives yeah, the decision. That was really important to me. And it's very important to me in everything that we do, both internally and externally is that if you put a, put your thumb over the logo, would you know 
where it came from, you know, and I think our culture mm. and document is like that. It's always what I say about an Instagram account, what I say about creative. It's like certainly something that I was again taught when I was in these big, beautiful brands was like, what did it truly mean to be unique? And that you, that you had to do something that nobody else could do. And, and I held our culture document to the same thing. Cause you're right. You can end up with a lot of platitudes and it doesn't mean they're not important, but it doesn't give people enough distinction to really navigate what what is what is our world versus maybe something that they would have experienced before. So let's talk about those kind of long-standing brands. Um, you mentioned I really love the 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 framing around it, but you know this hundred-year brand concept, mm -hmm. like at, that LVMH really stands behind. I know Warren Buffett talks a lot about that that people really underestimate the value. Like there is tangible value to a brand, right? Coca-Cola without ever selling another, you know, uh, another Coke would have value just because so many people know about it. Um, not that, you know, Coke has its own issues, but um, so for you, one of the things that I've thought is interesting is you have this kind of hundred year brand concept, but at the same time, you know, you've been involved in private equity and as, as well as involved, you know, I know that, or I would imagine that Supergoop does have some investors as well. How do you manage those expectations, right? Saying like, hey, I want to build this for 100 years. I don't want to build this for five, even though I know that's your, your investment horizon. Um, mm -hmm. How have you navigated that? Do you find that's a difficult concept to kind of, uh, to get them aligned with? No, because I don't think they're in conflict. Uh, you know, I, th I think many people assume that if you might only own something for, five years or seven years or three years or whatever it ends up, you know, being in a, in a private equity portfolio that that by definition means you have to be short-sighted in your, in your decisions. And I actually think it's the reverse. I think the greatest exits, the greatest long-term stories, those are always built on the back of long-term decision-making, not making decisions minute by minute, not trying to jam some sales out the door because you're going to hit up, you know, and, and I'm, look, I'm lucky. I have a, a board and a founder and, you know, a support system around me that certainly share that belief that, that are aligned, that they're not in conflict. But I, I, I think that it's a misconception um, that they, that there is such a, that they pull in opposite directions. Uh, because I think if you, you know, and if you're really building equity value, um, equity value to your point is, is based on is certain, look, the numbers are important. I started with the numbers, <laughs> like I said, the Excel spreadsheet, you know, that, that is still something that I think about, but there's things that don't go in a spreadsheet. There's things that won't fill up if it in a spreadsheet. And those are the things that I think really, you know, create, create things that are something special. And I think if you create something that's something special, the rest will create, you know, take care of itself. Still it'd, be really, it'd be really Still nice to your number every month. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> I, you know, again, I, I just, I just see them as, I think I see them as mutually reinforcing, not in conflict. Absolutely. And I think that's the truth. I think that it's hard to see that, right? Like we have very little pressure, right? We have quarterly board meetings and, you know, we have to make sure we hit our numbers, but you know, John and I own the majority of the company. And so it's just not, you know, we don't have face that same kind of pressure. But I look at some of these, particularly public equities, which are even harder than private equity, right? Where the, the time horizon's next quarter and like the pressure is hit your numbers. And, um, and I just think that there are significant strategic advantages if you are actually able to think really long-term, um, which I think is probably one of the more inspiring things about LVMH as a company is just that they actually do it, right? They actually do think. 50 years down the line, um, which is just, this is very difficult to do. Like I, I definitely don't do it all the time. Um, are there, you know, so speaking outside of, obviously you've worked at a lot of really awesome organizations. Um, are there other brands that you look at and really admire? Um, are there others that you, you know, you really pay attention to? Yeah, I mean, I, look, I, I actually try and think a lot outside of, of beauty. Uh, you know, and I, I try and pay a lot of attention to, some of the new brands that are, you know, getting created. I think there's a lot of exciting things that are happening out there. Uh, you know, I do, I'm, I still really admire some of the, the big brands and the, and the longstanding ones. I think that that probably makes me a, a different kind of leader than a lot of people um, out there today uh, is that I, I do admire um, these, you know, whatever heritage brands and, and some of the words that are attached to them. 
Um, you know, one of my favorites that I'll, I'll give a shout out to is Warby Parker. Um, I'm sure mm-hmm. it gets used a lot, um, but I, I, you know, I think it's because it's super, you know, product very distinctive, very thoughtful about who it is, who it's not. Unbelievably strong uh, voice, creative that's aligned with you know. It's not. It's easy to say I want to be the Warby Parker of X, but it's it that I don't think really carries a lot of weight or an understanding of what they've really created. Uh, and, and so I'm a brand person first. The, the thing that I always, it's in aesthetics, uh, you know, is something that is really, um, I think a, a really powerful concept that doesn't get talked enough about is kind of like, what are you, what is your eye just drawn to? Mm-hmm. And brands that I admire are always, you know, they're ones that are truly beautiful in whatever way you want to define that. Uh, and, and are really unique again, like that, those are the two things that, that impact, uh, that make a real impact for me, um, is if I feel like, gosh, there's nobody else that's doing it just the way that they are. You would assume that other people would have tried to copy that model or tried to compete with Warby Parker. And I'm sure that there are, but they just, just haven't gotten there. Right. And again, it's like you said, it's a lot of the things that you can't put into a spreadsheet. Like it just looks better. Don't know how to describe it. Just feels it looks better, but they also operate like in an incredible way, right? They, yeah. they, they're not just thinking about what does it look like on the Instagram feed, but they have thought through, you know, how do I get my glasses? What's the factory that makes them? Like, I mean, there's, there's a lot in there. Um, it's vertically integrated. You know, again, I'm going back to my LVMH examples, right? The <laughs> whole system, they've got the retail, like, that is hard to replicate, right? It's, it's always, anybody can do a photo shoot, right? And sort of say, here's my thing that looks kind of on trend and with the aesthetic of the times. Um, but that doesn't, that's not going to get you all the way there. Yeah. Well, let's talk about influencer marketing now that we are, you know, 50 minutes in. And I'm assuming this is what people are very curious about when it comes to Supergoop and you guys. So 370%, 370% from 2017 in terms of growth. Um, what, how would you describe your kind of influencer philosophy? Like, how do you work with the creators? Talk to me a little bit about what your guys' approach is. First, it goes back to finding people that are better at it than I am. So yep, I'll start yep. by that. We've got a wonderful team who tells me what we're going to do. <laughs> uh, but I will, I will say a few things on, on top of that. Um, you know, one is relationships. We, you know, again, this goes back to our culture and, you know, these are not transactions. Um, these are people who, you know, this is, this is their livelihood. This is their purpose. This is the thing that, that this is how they're expressing themselves, the outside world. So, you know, we really think about it as like, this is a relationship. And it's, again, it's, it's something that's about a human to human contact. Uh, and so, and look, tools are really helpful to kind of help you meet the right person, right? Uh, but, but that's not what it's about. Uh, and I think that, you know, our team really thinks about it that way, treats people that way, interacts with them that way. And, and that's what we hope. It's a friendship, it's a relationship. And, and yes, you know, I'll be the first to say we pay for when we, you know, we need content that's very specific and on a certain moment in time. And, and we do that happily because mm-hmm. again, this is, you know, I really look at it as like, this is how these this is, this is what their career is, right? Like, how could I expect somebody not to be compensated for that, right? That's, that's only fair. Uh, but it grows into a lot more than that. And, you know, we have a wonderful founder who they can ask SPF questions of any time and we try and make things fun and, and create just joy in people's lives. I mean, that really goes back to um, our brand, you know, really try and create education, create aha moments. Um, and, and I don't, I, you know, I just don't ever want to see it as a transactional thing. Um, and, and usually out of that comes more content and more exposure that maybe wasn't part of the quote unquote campaign. So I think it's like anything else that if you really think about, um, you know, what's your story and and how to communicate it to another human, uh, then, you know, you're, you're in good shape. Yeah, I think the, I mean, like you said, I think being long-term thinking in business makes sense. Being long-term thinking on the influencer side makes sense, right? Which is like, these people are trying to make a living. We want to make sure that we are, you know, helping them do that. 
But at the same time, this is about the relationship long-term and about ways that we can help them as well as ways they can help us. Absolutely. Um, so when you guys think of, do you guys have kind of set KPIs around influencer marketing or how do you keep track of kind of progress? I think it really depends on the situation, right? There's, mm -hmm. there's no one size fits all in this. Again, you're going to be like, ah, she's back to the hundred different decisions, right? There's no <laughs> It depends on the type of content. It depends on the time of year. It depends on, is it a launch? Is it not a launch? You know, it depends on the individual, right? Some mm -hmm. are very strong in certain ways and others are super strong. That's what makes the world go round, right? And so I think we try not to sort of, you know, that being said, again, back to the spreadsheet, we're gonna be analytical. We are custodians of a business and, you know, have a mission and we've got to make sure that when we put money to work, that it does drive ultimately our goal and our mission. But I, I don't think that there's one, there's one number that you say, oh, if you hit that, then you're good. If you don't, too bad. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of gray in it. Uh, and so I think we try and be really holistic about it. So the numbers and uh, <laughs> is, is definitely how we try and think about it. I dig it. Do um, you guys feel like you've made any, any mistakes along the way in kind of working with the creators? Any, any mistake has been because, you know, we, we, all, we, we always work with people who know and love our brand, mm -hmm. um, not because they're good sales drivers or something else like that. The mistakes have been when we forget that. Mm. Yeah, you pursue short term. Again, God, I'm gonna, people are gonna hate me for how many times I've said the word short term, long term. Um, okay, well, I think with that, I'd love to get into just a couple fun questions uh, okay. to finish off. Um, so the first question, and you, <laughs> I want you to actually try and I calculate this. this. I may refrain from answering it. But <laughs> <fire> away. <laughs> no, and you have to, this is being said in the, in the best hearted way. How many times a week, and I want you to try to calculate this, do you say the word SPF? Oh, that is a wonderful one. I actually <laughs> love it. Um, I'd like to get back to you. Um, I don't know, hundreds probably. I was, it's funny, I have a six-year-old and last night I was trying to teach him how to think about math when you're, he was trying to count the bubbles in the bubble bath. And I was like, well, yeah, you, yeah. you sort of try to isolate the numbers out. So that's literally what's going through my head now. Uh, <laughs> this is like one know, of those interview hundreds, questions. Hundreds easily. Yeah. Um, and if you can include super goop and sunscreen and all of that, you know, you, you would have a multiplier effect on it, but not yeah. enough, not enough. Yeah. The world not world enough. World, there's still, uh, the, the statistics are still there. Um, we still have a lot of work to do. You know, <laughs> I'm so proud of how far we've come. And, you know, we have created a category that many people like to, um, you know, they say imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. Um, we have a lot of people that certainly like to imitate us, but that just drives us harder and we have, we have more work to do. So. Well, I can tell you, I mean, change like that, it just takes a really long time. It does. And, and there's a lot of work put in before I, before I came, there's a lot of work still to do. Um, that's what makes it exciting. I mean, that's what keeps me learning is that, you know, Holly and I think, you know, we'll, we will have accomplished what we're trying to accomplish when skin cancer rates go from one in five to one in 10 to one in five. Like that's our measure of success. Uh, and I, you know, we still got a long way to go towards that. That's pretty cool. I can tell you, I like, I don't think I put on sunscreen until four or five years ago. Like I'd put it on like in extreme scenarios, but not on a daily basis. Uh -huh. Um, you know, that, and still most people don't put it on on a daily basis. Yeah. And I'd say I'm like three out of seven days, four out of seven days right now. Like if I, but it's still, it's way more than what I used to put it on before. Of yes or no. Why, you know, what can I do to convince you of like, what, what is that like? Oh, there's, it's not sunny today. Cause guess what? UVA rays are coming through the clouds. I see the window behind you. <laughs> is this the, uh, is this a product I, development I, I, I meeting? <laughs> I can't, well, because your audience might be listening, so I need to make sure that I'm communicating <laughs> to them um, about why. I just don't think I have enough super goop, so I think uh, we, uh... <laughs> Okay, we will solve that problem. <laughs> that way you can really use the next time I talk to you. Yeah, I think, you know, people, I, the thing I've always latched onto, or not always latched onto, but um, the way it was described to me one time that makes sense is kind of structure versus agency, right? Which is 
you know, agency is like, okay, I'm making the decision to put on sunscreen mm -hmm. versus structure is it's really easy for me to put it on. Right. So like having it on the side table, right. As we leave and walk out the door is like something that makes it easier. Right. And so for me, I don't think, I think I've developed some systems there, but not as many systems as I'd like to make it just as easy as possible. Um, and part of it's just buying a lot of product. So I think I just need more of it. So, um, you know, so. So what, what you'd like to have, um, <laughs> that, that's an easy problem to fix, but I think you're right. I mean, I think that's the essence of how we think about product is so that it is easy. So it's full of joy so that you want to do it. And, you know, that's why we build SPF into great beauty and skincare products um, so that it's not a chore, um, but it's really, you know, a ritual that people enjoy. So you've got 20 minutes free. Mm -hmm. Do you do a book, Netflix, or a podcast? Book. Book? Okay. Follow-up question. Favorite books? Oh, goodness. A uh, list that's too long for, <laughs> for give us me, to Give me two. Uh, Favorite fiction, anything Jane Austen. Okay. Uh, you know, just she does no wrong in my in my view. Uh, and I'll give you my latest business book because um, I'm always trying a new one. Um, I'm reading Unleashed by a professor at HBS, Francis Fry, uh, mm -hmm. who I heard on a, a, I don't know, you know, sort of a Zoom event. And her philosophy on leadership is just a bullseye for everything that I believe in. And I think is really a, a point of view for the future about sort of, you know, just a very different definition of, of what it means to be a leader. So I'm, I'm really inspired by what she's written um, about two thirds of the way through. So. I'll have to add it to the list. Mm -hmm. um, just came out, yeah, probably a month ago. Well, I want to thank you again, Amanda, for taking out the time. Uh, today was great. I think people are going to learn a lot. I know I learned a lot and um, and yeah, just thanks so much for taking out the time and Thank wishing you me. It's super fun. Wishing continued success to Supergroup. I know you guys are going to continue to kill it. So uh, it'll be Thank fun you. to watch it from the outside. Thank you so much. All right. Bye, Amanda. Bye. Hit subscribe now. Earned by Tribe Dynamics. Tribe Dynamics unlocks your social media influencer community. Our platform not only tracks and measures your best influencer relationships, but discovers new influencers to grow your business through earned media. Get started with a demo today at TribeDynamics.com. TribeDynamics.com.